Thanks for joining us for today's message. We encourage you to visit southernhillslv.com to watch or listen to past messages. We hope you enjoy today's message from God's Word. All right, here we go. Look at the Bible in Mark chapter number 2, verse 14. Mark chapter number 2, and verse 14 is where our text begins. And he, Jesus, passed by and saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax office, and he said unto him, follow me. Father God, in prayer, I pray that you would, in this moment, fill this place with your Holy Spirit, just as you have filled it with your holy people, and I pray that you would fill me with your holy word, so that as I speak today, I would not speak my own opinions, my own thoughts, my own perspectives but that I would speak the very words of God to my friends who have come here today. And I pray, Father, that as you fill this place with your Holy Spirit, you would fill me, your vessel, with your Holy Spirit to accomplish what only you can do. God, we need to understand how to deal with haters. Negative individuals who pull us down and away from you and away from your calling in our lives. And I pray, Father, that you would do what I cannot do today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today's sermon, Bullies and Buckets, is to help you understand what the Bible says about how to deal with haters, how to deal with individuals who pull you down away from God and God's calling in your life. Bullies and Buckets is a metaphor. Why do I have to say that? Say metaphor. Metaphor. Say it again, metaphor. metaphor. The reason I have to say that is because we have some in our congregation who may not grasp that. Say who? Like my daughter. A few weeks ago, I preached a sermon entitled Flint and Friction. In this four, five-week sermon series called Ignite, I had all these really cool titles that I wrote. And they're really metaphors, you know. And, and I, I got in the car with my daughter as we drove home, and I said, hey, did you like today's sermon? She said, no. <laughs> and that wasn't usual. I said, why? She said, I didn't know what you were talking about. And I said, what do you mean? She said, I don't know what that is. You said, what it is. I said, what are you talking about? You don't understand the whole sermon at all? And she said, no. She said, I don't know what flint is. I said, well, you know, flint is the the thing and you you strike it and it makes a spark and a spark starts a small fire and it grows. And she said, well, you should have explained it. (laughs) Everybody's a critic, you know what I mean? Everybody. So I'm going to explain, right? The sermon series began with flint and friction. What we're saying is in the ministry of Jesus, things started very small with John the Baptist and just a few disciples. In the second sermon, Friends on Fire, Jesus gathered his disciples around him, people that had the same passion and desire to grow as he wanted to expand this ministry. In the third sermon, we talked about feeding the flame, allowing yourself personal time with God so that God can feed that flame and desire and passion as you move forward in your calling. And in the fourth sermon, we have to understand, as you do these things, so was it in the life of Jesus. Enemies arose, bullies with buckets coming to drown out and drench the passionate fire that's coming up inside of you. So it is true in your life. So it is true once you find out God's calling and direction and purpose in your life, there will be enemies that rise up around and attempt to quench and douse the flame that is inside of each and every one of us. But they could not do it. No, they couldn't. In the life of Jesus, they could not quench his flame, the fire that was inside of him. I'll tell you why they could not do it, because his fire was unquenchable. Why was his fire unquenchable? Here's why. Because Jesus didn't care. Now, some of you say, how could you say Jesus didn't care? I didn't say that Jesus didn't care about them. I'm saying Jesus didn't care what bullies with buckets were trying to do to douse the flame. He wasn't living, listen, he wasn't living to impress the crowds or please his critics. He wasn't living to impress the crowds or please his critics. Jesus was living for an audience of one. And that's the proposition for today's sermon. I hope you'll follow Jesus' example as we'll study it out here. Live for an audience of one. Say it with me today. 
live for an audience of one. Every teenager, every adult, every senior today, say it with me. Live for an audience of one. Stop trying to please the crowds. Stop trying to make your critics like you. Live for an audience of one. And this is why they hated Jesus. The Jesus haters hated Jesus for several reasons. I'm going to give them to you as we study this passage. The first reason the Jesus haters hated Jesus, number one, is because he wasn't worried about his reputation. Some of you in your life, you've got family, you've got friends, you've got co-workers who genuinely dislike you. And what I want you to do is learn what Jesus knew. Stop worrying about your reputation, what they think. Here, I'll say it bluntly. Who cares? Here in this passage, Jesus haters criticize his company. Look at verse 14. And as Jesus passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax office. And he said unto him, follow me. So Jesus is in Capernaum, and he walks by, and there, there's a man named Levi. Later, we find his name is Matthew. Matthew changes his name to Matthew, and he's a tax collector. He's sitting at the tax office, and Jesus says, hey, hey, follow me, and uh, so he arose, and he followed him. Now, what happened is he was dining at Levi's house, so Matthew, Levi, this tax collector, said, hey, now that I'm a disciple of yours, let me, let me stop and say this. If Jesus said to you, follow me, would you do it, yes or no? Yes. That means you're a disciple of Jesus. And Jesus, and Matthew said to Jesus, hey, why don't you come over to my house for dinner? I've got some friends coming over. And Jesus is like, sure, I'll go to your house for dinner. And so we invited, by the way, it's always nice to invite your pastor to dinner. <laughs> Especially if it's at Texas Day Brazil. Can I get an amen? amen. God bless that meat, meat palace. All right, just a little commercial there. All right. So. Now it happened as he was dining at Levi's house that many tax collectors and sinners also sat there together with Jesus and his disciples. So they're all having dinner together and there's a bunch of tax collectors. And then the Bible says sinners. Who are these? These are random sinners in the community. They were known as sinners. They, they sinned. They did bad things. Well, you and I would fit into that category, I think. I know we're at church and there's a lot of very religious people here. God bless you. You're better than us, but the rest of us are just a bunch of sinners, or at least have been saved from our sin. Sinners, saved by grace. And there were many, and the Bible says they followed him. This is what was crazy. Jesus goes into this tax collector's home, a bunch of tax collectors and sinners, and the Bible says a many of them followed him, which means they, they understood who they were, sinners. They understood who he was, Savior. They repented of their sin, and they received Christ as Savior. They were born again. How awesome is that? Amen? Have you ever been born again? Have you been saved? Have you been saved? I loved how the video a moment ago, in the middle of the song, all these people talking about how they got saved and when they got saved. Here's my question. Have you been saved? When did you get saved? If you haven't been saved, receive Christ today. You can. He loves you. He died for your sins, buried, rose from the grave. Listen, repent and receive Christ today. Become a true follower. So all of this is going on. What does this have to do with our sermon today, Pastor? Look, it goes on. It says, Jesus here, here was, he was sitting there eating with all of these people. Verse 16, and when the scribes and the Pharisees, when I say the scribes and the Pharisees go, boo, these are the, these are the Jesus haters. When the scribes and the Pharisees very important religious leaders. They saw that Jesus was with the tax collectors and the sinners. They said to his disciples, how is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? Now, let me explain historically what's going on. Tax collectors at this time were, it, it was scandalous to be a tax collector. And to be around tax collectors was equally scandalous. I'll tell you why. Because Israel was an occupied country. Ima imagine this. We are not in an occupied country. We are Americans. We live in the United States. How many of you thank God for America? Amen. 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 We love this country. But could you imagine an outside foreign power coming and taking over our country? And then they levied heavy taxes on our businesses. So no longer do you have a nice home and a nice family. You're not just paying taxes to the American government. You're now paying 20 to 25, 30% of your income to a foreign government as well. How many of you would not be happy with that? 
And the way they begin to raise their taxes is they find other people in your neighborhood, in your community, in your city, and they ask other Americans to rise up and you start taking taxes from these people and send it to us. They would be considered traitors. Benedict Arnold's, you see? They, they are collaborators with the evil empire. Do you understand? That's who these people are. And Jesus said, hey, I'm going to find some people to be my followers, not just fishermen and farmers. I'm going to go after the worst of the worst, even tax collectors, and see if they'll follow me. Aren't you thankful Jesus will take anybody that has his follower? Amen? Amen. Amen. And so this is why the religious people are so high on their religious high horse. Jesus, you're, you're eating with tax collectors and sinners. How dare you? You're not holy and righteous like us. That's what's going on. Now, let me ask you a question. Why was Jesus eating with his people? Why didn't he care what that... Here, here, look, look, look. The reason is, is because Jesus, Jesus couldn't care less about what they thought about him. He didn't care. But Jesus, those people don't like you. Jesus, the Pharisees and the religious people out there, they don't like you. And Jesus would say, yeah. So what? I don't know what it is about human beings that happen to be people pleasers. But the beautiful thing about Jesus is that Jesus didn't need their approval. Can I get an amen? amen. So Jesus, when he had heard it, he said unto them, those who are well need no physician, but those that are sick. I do not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He says to these people, he says to these religious people, look, I'm not here for, for healthy people who don't need me. You're so holy and righteous, you don't need a Savior. I'm here for the people who are sinners who need a Savior. Now look at me. Some of us have been so convinced in our minds, and you may have arrived this way, because you were raised as a Baptist, or raised as a Catholic, or raised as a Mormon, or raised as some religious person, maybe a Muslim, or, or in, in Judaism, or some religious background, you think, I don't need Jesus as my Savior. Look, we all need Jesus as our Savior. And Jesus said, look, Jesus said this, I don't care what religious background you are, you're welcome here. And the reality is what Jesus was saying was this, look, I didn't come to those who think they don't need me. I came to the sinners. He didn't care about his reputation. Say, I don't care. Say it. I don't care. Say it with some passion. Say, I don't care. I don't care. Say it one more time. I don't care. I don't have you found it hard to care about everything? It's exhausting. I mean, everything in life, it's like everybody wants you to care about everything. I just get tired. My carbon footprint. I found out a couple years ago, I have, to, I have to care now about that. I don't know what it is. I don't know, I don't know what my carbon... Is it like a... Credit score? Where do you look it up? I don't even know. Now, some of you are getting offended. You're like, you should care. I'm trying to, but it's so hard to care about everything. You know what I mean? Like, I, I got to care about my carbon footprint. A lot of people really, I got to, some people really care a lot about who Brad Pitt is dating. <laughs> no, I know they do because I go to the grocery store. I'm at Albertsons. I'm there getting my food. And, and as I'm there, there, there's magazines and Brad Pitt is on there. Always talks about who he's dating. And I'm like, I don't care. I don't, I don't care. You say, oh, you should care, but I don't. I don't care. It's hard to care about my carbon footprint and Brad Pitt all at the same time. You know, it's just, <laughs> it's exhausting. I don't know. I don't, I don't care who's in the Super Bowl. <laughs> oh, my word. Did I just lose some of you? You're like, global warming, who cares? But pass to the Super Bowl, you know? Look, I gotta be honest, it's like so hard to care about Brad Pitt, carbon footprints in the Super Bowl all in the same week. I'm exhausted. I don't care. I don't care if my I don't care if the chicken was happy. <laughs> if it was free range or if it was in a cage. I don't know. I don't like was the chicken did the was the chicken a happy chicken? Hey, was that a chicken? was I at the rest I don't know if it was a happy chicken. 
I don't know. I just get the chicken. I go to Albertsons. I buy the chicken. I buy the cheap chicken, which probably means the cheap chicken was not a happy chicken. I know it wasn't. And I'm like, but it's so hard to care, you know? You say, you need to love the chickens. I do. After I cook it, I love it. I'm like, I love this chicken. And he is making me happy. Oh, Pastor, you shouldn't joke. You should care. Christians are crazy about this stuff. They, they care about everything. The latest boycotts. I get tired of this. Oh, you got to boycott Target. Well, you got to boycott Nike. You got to boycott Chick-fil-A. You got to boycott Starbucks. And we're always, we always care. And we so care. Oh, we're so care. Look, I don't, look, let me, I, I don't care. <laughs> and you know what I care very little about? I really don't care what religious hypocrites think of me. Why do you care what the people at work think of you? You elevate it to idolatry. Why do you care so much about what family who doesn't like you, doesn't even like you, why does it bother you so much what they think about you? Why does it bother you that there are haters that don't like you? The more you rise as God blesses you, the more haters you're going to have in life. Why do you have to be pleasing to everyone? Why do you have to have everybody's approval in your life? Even Jesus, how many of you agree? Jesus, good guy. Well, I hope so. You're a Christian. The reason they hated Jesus, number one, is because he wasn't worried about his reputation. Say, I don't care. care. Why? Because he was living for the audience of one. I'm not saying don't care what anybody thinks. I'm saying care what God thinks. Number two, the first reason they hated Jesus because he wasn't worried about his he wasn't worried about his reputation, and they were so consumed with their reputation. For somebody with approval addiction, this was mind blowing. Jesus, how could you not care what we think? And he says, I don't care. Number two, why did they hate Jesus? Because he rejected their religious rituals. They hated Jesus because he rejected their religious rituals. And in this passage, we see the Jesus haters criticizing Jesus for his lack of respect for tradition. Look at verse 18. The disciples of John and the Pharisees were fasting, and they came to Jesus, and they said unto him, Why do your disi- Why did the disciples of John and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? <laughs> fasting means to go without food. It's very religious, very important. Now, during the law, during this time when Jesus lived, there was one day that the religious people were commanded to fast. They had to fast on the Day of Atonement. That was it. But the Pharisees and the followers of John were more religious, and they added all sorts of extra rituals, and they stopped eating every Monday and every Thursday, the whole day, from sunup to sundown, you weren't allowed to eat. And if you fasted, you were considered a better religious person. And if you didn't follow their rituals, you were a bad religious person. So they came to Jesus, and they said, Jesus, why don't your followers fast like my followers do. You know what Jesus' response basically was? It was, great, good for you. Listen, Jesus didn't tell them not to do their religious rituals. Jesus said, fantastic, good for you. But here's the problem with so many religious people. Because they have a religious ritual, they demand that you have it too. And Jesus is like, no, no, no. I'm not going to do it. But you got to. Why? Don't have to. Now, get this because it's key to the sermon. Look, I don't have to go to confession. You say, but you're a Christian. You should go in a booth and tell somebody your secrets. I don't have to go to confession. Do you know why I don't have to go to confession? Because it's a religious ritual that's not found in the Bible. I don't have to do it. I don't have to. Look at this. I, don't, I realize this is such freedom. I don't have to drive a hybrid. <laughs> for some people, their religious ritual is, is, is one, some for the other. I don't have to. You say, but oh, I drive a hybrid. Don't you care? I don't have to. And I feel very happy. I don't feel, I li- too many Americans feel under guilt about everything. I don't have to eat kosher. Thank God. <laughs> I don't have to eat vegan. Thank God. 
You say, but, but, but I have to. It's fine. You do you. Stop putting your non-biblical religious rituals on everybody else's door, doorstep. Um, I come from a religious tradition that, that values, you know, um, dressing uh, in ties. You got to wear a tie when you preach, especially. And, and so I don't, I don't normally wear a tie when I preach. I had one of our ushers come in. And as I came in, one of my ushers looked at me and said, ooh, a tie. Do we have dignitaries here today? I fired them. I said, get, a, get, out of my, get out of my church. What are you, you're a comedian? I'll tell the jokes around here. Here's the thing. I don't care what religious tradition you come from, whether it be Mormon or Catholic or, or something, Baptist. Religious traditions are religious traditions. And sometimes when you reject the religious traditions of others, you will get hated for it. Jesus said unto them in verse 19, can a friend of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is still with them? Basically, Jesus said, let me answer your question why my, my disciples aren't fasting. He basically said, I'm still here, but there will be a day when I'm not here and they will naturally go without food because they're going to miss me so much. So he answers their question. But then he goes on and he says, he gives two metaphors. I'm glad we're talking about metaphors early on because these are two metaphors he gives. The two metaphors he gives, the first one he says, can't, Jesus says, can you take an old piece of cloth and a new piece of cloth and sew them together? And Jesus said, no, because it'll rip. And then he says, can you take new wine and pour it into an old wineskin? Now, all of you and I would say, of course not. Why? Because we know everything about wineskins, right? No, we know nothing. But the idea is, Jesus said, no, because if you put new wine into an old wineskin, it'll crack and burst. Two metaphors to say the same thing. Jesus said, look, fellas, you have all your religious Jewish tradition, but Jesus saying, I'm establishing something new here. It's the movement called Christianity, and the two do not fit perfectly together in that way. What Jesus was saying is if you're going to follow me, Jesus is saying, you're going to have to turn your back on religious tradition. Religious rituals, religious law. This is what's going on. See, the real issue is the old religious rituals of Judaism are not the compatible with true Christianity. You cannot tack Jesus onto your religion. Now, a lot of us come from a lot of different backgrounds. I know we have former Hindus and Buddhists here, and I'm so glad you're here. Everybody is welcome here. Listen, you cannot tack Jesus onto your preferenced religion. This is one of the problems that missionaries experience when they go to uh, Hindu, in, in Hindu countries. A Hindus have over 300 million gods. And then you say, let me tell you about Jesus. And they're like, he's a god? And you say, yes, he's a god. And then what they do is they'll take a picture of Jesus uh, and put it in their, in their, their uh, temple with all the other gods. It's called syncretism, and it's not Christianity. No, the answer is you throw away all of your old religion and you follow Christ and him alone. That's what the Bible here is saying. And th this is what Jesus is expressing. This is why he was hated. Therefore, to truly follow Christ, you must leave your religion behind and its rituals. And it's not easy. Let me give you an example of how it's not easy. I remember, I remember counseling a young couple who got saved, like genuinely born again. And they came from families that were somewhat religious, but they did not know Jesus as Savior. And they got saved, and they got baptized, and they got married, and it was so cute and adorable, sweet young couple coming to the church. And then God blessed them through their love with a baby, a new baby. And suddenly, their family wanted to get involved. Their family came in and said, you've got to baptize that baby. If you don't baptize that baby, God's going to damn that baby, and that baby's going to go to hell. My question always is, show me that in the Bible. So they came and said, oh, that, Pastor, I don't think the Bible says that. Like, no, that's not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. It's religious tradition. Pastor, they're pretty insistent. If we don't follow their religious rituals, if we don't follow their religious traditions, they're going to get upset with us. Yep. Yes, yes. That's exactly what happens. In the Baptist tradition, we don't normally have drums on the stage. We've had people upset because we don't follow their religious tradition. 
I've had people upset at our church because we don't preach from exactly the same English version of the Bible they do, religious tradition. Isn't that amazing? But this is filled. Listen to me. It's filled. And what you've got to understand is, number one, the reason they hate Jesus is he wasn't worried about his reputation. He rejected their religious rituals. Number three, he ignored their man-made rules. This continues the theme of why they hated Jesus. And in verse 23, we see that the Jesus haters are offended by his refusal to submit to their rules. See, this is what happens. I don't know. I've touched on a lot of bases. Catholic tradition, Baptist tradition, Mormon traditions. I've touched on a lot of them right now. And some of us, even right now, begin to get a little nervous because we're like, oh, oh, that's my religious tradition. I know it is. Relax. This is why he was hated. He ignored their man-made rules. And in this specific passage, I'll tell you what happens. What happens is that the Jesus haters are offended because he refuses to submit to their rules. Look at verse 23. Now it happened that he was through the grain fields, walking through the grain fields on the Sabbath day, and they went with his disciples, began to pluck heads of grain. Okay, picture it now. Jesus is walking with his disciples down a road, and there's, um, there's a field of grain there. How many of you know what that looks like? You live in Las Vegas, so you haven't seen it for a long time, right? It's a field of grain. And the Bible says his disciples and Jesus reach over and they grab some grain off of the stalks and they rub it in their hands. They take the, like, granola and they start eating it. Now, some of you as Americans, you're like, that's stealing! But actually, according to the law back then in Deuteronomy, the Bible says that they had a right to do that. It wasn't stealing as long as you weren't harvesting a big crop. If you're hungry, you could take a piece of fruit and go for it. How many of you kind of wish you lived under that law right now, you know what I mean? You're like, my, my, my neighbor has an orange tree, you know. <laughs> my wife, my family and I went with the Combs to California just a couple weeks ago, and we're walking. We got a little Airbnb near Disneyland, and we were walking to Disneyland, and as we went, there was something that caught my wife's eye. My wife is a huge lover of white grapefruit, not pink grapefruit, not ruby red grapefruit, white grapefruit. And they're so hard to come by. And as we're walking down this road, she looks over, she said, there it is. I said, what? It's a white grapefruit tree. Big, juicy white grapefruits just hanging from the vines. I looked at her. She looked at my daughter. All I heard about all day at Disneyland was those grapefruits. So we're walking back from Disneyland that night, and she said, this is it. She walked up to... (laughs) She walked up to the door of the house and knocked. Nobody was there. She looked around at the grapefruit, and the neighbor was there. And so she said to the neighbor, hey, do you think it would be okay if if I took some of the grapefruit? I like, love white grapefruits. And how many of you know Heather? She's a very bold person, right? (laughs) This does not surprise us. So she said, can I have some of those grapefruit? And the lady beside said, no. We eat all of them. And my wife is like, really? You eat all of them? I can't have a... And she's like, no. And then, then my wife left, and she was very sad. What's the point of the story? There's no point in the story. <laughs> Other than if we lived back in that day and age, you could go and do that. This was not against the law. You could go and take somebody, as long as you're not harvesting, but you could take some. What they were upset about is the Bible says that you could not work on the Sabbath day, which means you could not harvest your fields. What the Pharisees did, look at the next verse and I'll show you what happens. Verse 24, and the Pharisees said unto Jesus, look, why do they do that which is not lawful on the Sabbath? See, there was no work on the Sabbath. The problem was what the Pharisees did is they added a bunch of man-made rules on top of that one God law. The man-made rules, they made 39 man rules on top of the God law. God said, don't work on the Sabbath. They created 35 man rules that said, this is how and what and how to describe that work so that now they could not even reach over and take a sunflower seed out of a sunflower and crack it and eat it without it being called work. Listen to me. Listen to me. That is the essence of man-made rules and man-made religion. It becomes a burden on the soul. Listen, Christianity has never been meant to be a burden to the soul. God's laws are a delight to the soul, not a burden. In fact, Jesus addresses the Sabbath. He says in the next few verses, you guys misunderstand the the Sabbath law. 
Jesus said, look, humans were not created to follow the rules of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was created to be a blessing to humans. God doesn't create rules. Or excuse me, look at me, look at me, religious people. God doesn't create you to follow rules. He made a few rules to be a blessing to you, to keep us out of trouble. Don't you understand? This is what religion often mistakes and misunderstands and destroys. Becoming, and this is why, why? This is why it's important here. Listen now. Here's why this is important. Because becoming a Christian should feel like freedom, not frustration. Becoming a Christian, listen, it should feel like chains are falling away, not like chains are pulling you down. And I, and I, I fear that in a lot of our churches, including this church, when people get saved, they suddenly feel overwhelmed by all the new things they have to do. And you forget from whence you were saved. Slavery to sin, to other people's opinions, to other people's rituals. This is the essence of legalism. And like Jesus, a lot of you in this room have to deal with haters, with slander, with gossip. But listen, you have enemies. Listen, listen to me, listen, listen. I want you to understand this truth. Their hate, their slander, their gossip says more about them than it does about you. I'm a, very simple question. Jesus, good guy or bad guy? Good guy? Some of you at church are not sure. So I'm going to give you that one more chance. The answer is good guy. Okay, let's do it again. Jesus, good guy or bad guy? Good guy. Still had haters. You see, their hate, slander, and gossip said far more about them than it did about Jesus. And so it is true for you and I. Friend, that's why number four is so essential as we close the sermon. Why did they hate Jesus? Number four, because he demonstrated love even to his enemies. In this last passage we're going to study today, Jesus gently demonstrates love. He gently attempts to convince his own haters. This is what the world can't understand about true Christians. The way the world works is this. You attack me, I attack you twice as hard. The way Jesus works is this. You attack me, and I show you love. See, Jesus knew that every critic was a possible convert. Instead of viewing your family that's putting you under such pressure, your co-workers that are putting you under such pressure, your friends that are putting you under such pressure, instead of viewing them as an enemy, view them as a possible convert to Jesus. This is why he said, love your enemies. Look, let me just shoot straight with you as your pastor. Some of y'all just need to chill out. Just because you have people against you doesn't mean you have to be against them. Just because they view you as an enemy doesn't mean you have to see an enemy in them. Jesus Christ, just because they viewed Jesus as an enemy, Jesus never viewed them as the enemy. He viewed them as potentially converted to his cause, to his salvation. Look at what happens in Mark chapter 3 and verses 1 through 6. It's an amazing little story. It says, and Jesus entered in the synagogue again, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they watched him closely, whether he would heal the man on the Sabbath so that he might accuse him. See, there was a little trap that was set. Jesus was back in this. Remember, I showed you a couple weeks ago, the synagogue in Capernaum. This is what's taking place again. Jesus is back in that little synagogue. Here's what it looks like even today. You can go there and visit it and see it. It's an amazing thing. This is what it looked like back then. Back then, it looked just like this. And they sat on the outside. See the outside edge? And they would teach from the middle. That's what would happen. A lot of people would sit on the edge, the elders, and then the other people could sit around the floor or stand. And Jesus walks in, and the haters were there, and his followers were there. And they had brought in a man with a withered hand. And the, set, the, the trap was set. Would Jesus perform a miracle on the Sabbath day? Ooh! 
Because he's God, he knows it's a trap. So Jesus walks in, and he sees this man. Look at verse 3. It says, and he said to the man that had a withered hand, step forward. See, he's standing there in the middle of the synagogue. He says, step forward so everybody can see you in the middle of the synagogue. And there Jesus said to him and said to everyone, listen to what he says. This is key. Is it lawful to do good or evil on the Sabbath day? To help people or to harm people? And the enemies of Jesus couldn't answer a word. The reason they couldn't answer a word is because anything they said would contradict their own worldview and their own religion. And so they say not a word. And so Jesus, look what it says in verse 5, and when Jesus had looked around at them with anger, being grieved in his hardness of their hearts, why? Because they were obstinate, stupid, their obstinate stupidity, their willingness to be blind, Jesus said to the man, stretch out your hand. And immediately the man stretched it out and the hand was restored as the whole as the other. Why does this whole charade go on? Hear me. Why does Jesus put up with this? Hear me. Because he cares, yes, about the man with the withered hand, but he also cares about the people around him who hate him. And he attempts to reach them with love and compassion and demonstrate his power even to them. But verse 6, unfortunately, look, many of those haters, it says in verse 6, went out and immediately plotted with the Herodians against him how they might destroy Jesus. Now look, not every single one of the haters of Jesus ended up wanting to kill him. Because Jesus patiently reached out with love and demonstrated love, a lot of Pharisees and followers of these laws, those who used to hate Jesus, became followers of Jesus. Now look at me. Why in the world did Jesus take so much time to reach out to his haters? Here's why. Because he was living for the audience of one. Jesus knew, for God sent God so loved the world, the sinners, the tax collectors, the men with the withered hands, and God loved the religious rituals. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And because Jesus lived for the audience of one, he knew he didn't have to care what they thought, but he also didn't have to become an enemy to those who considered him, him an enemy. What a lesson for us. What an important lesson for us. Pastor, why are you sharing all this? I'll tell you why. Because I, my, my concern for you, for so many of us, is that this people-pleasing mentality might be holding you back. These bullies with buckets that come around you, you focus so much on them, you forget to build the flame. You see? My, my father, um, my father, uh, boy, now about 15 years ago, uh, was preaching one Sunday. My father's a pastor too. And after the sermon, he left the platform and some man said to him, hey, pastor, come with me. I want to take you somewhere. So my dad said, oh, all right. This is... He said, no, no, seriously, come with me. We're going to go somewhere. The guy got him in the car. They drove to a Ford dealership. And he said, I want you to get out uh, of the car. He said, pastor, I heard that you like Ford Mustangs and you've never had one. I'm going to buy you a brand new Ford Mustang. By the way, that is a great thing to do for a pastor. I just... <laughs> I'm, I, I'm not insinuating, I'm just saying what happened and that it was a nice thing. <laughs> no, like this is crazy. He's pastor 40 years. This the thing doesn't type of thing happen. So he says, are you saying, no, that's not unnecessary. He says, absolutely, I insist. He says, well, if you insist. And they went and they found this beautiful red 2002, I believe it was a 2002 brand new Corvette, uh, uh, Corvette, a convertible um, uh, Ford Mustang. Beautiful, beautiful. Brought it home. I, I had just finished college and I was at home staying with them. And um, I, I asked my dad, I said, Dad, could I drive it? And he said, no. <laughs> I said, but I just want to drive it, you know, like drive it around. And he's like, that's not going to happen. I said, but I'm your son. And he said, exactly. No, it's my car. I asked day after day, week after week, I just want to drive the car, drive the car, and wouldn't let me drive the car. 
I, I got a phone call one morning. I was at home. I got a phone call from my dad, and I looked at this. I'm like, oh, dad, hey, hey, dad, what's going on? He said, hey, Josh, I'm at work, and I need you to bring my car to work. I said, which one? He said, the Ford Mustang. I said, well, 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 well. <laughs> He didn't have to tell me twice. I grabbed the keys. I jumped in the Ford Mustang. Man, I was ready to go. I pulled down the top. I sat on the seat. I adjusted the mirrors. I, I, I adjusted the seat, brought it up. I always have to adjust the seat. That's of my, it's one of the plagues of being a powerful, small person. <laughs> brought it up, adjusted the mirrors, cranked the radio. I'm ready to go, baby. Put it in gear. Now, this, this was not an automatic. This was a manual. So I put it in first gear, and then I took off. And it was really weird, because I'd never drove, driven a, a Ford Mustang convertible before, and so I thought, maybe that's how we go. But it was like, it, as I went forward, and I pressed the I went forward, it like pulled back a little, and I went forward. I was like, well, that's weird. I got out of the neighborhood, put it into second gear, and I, I pressed on it. But every time I went to change gears, it was like it would pull back a little. I'm like, well, that's really strange. Maybe that's how Ford Mustangs work. Maybe they just pull back a little. Got on the freeway, fourth gear, fifth gear. Man, I was trucking, man. I am going down as fast as I possibly can. But every time I went into a new gear, it was something that just kind of like jerked back a little. It's like something was holding me back. Now, one of the dangers of being a, 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 um, a, uh, a small, uh, a petite, um, a more of a, a compact individual is that I can't see all of the lights on the dash. Little did I know there was a blinking light that said what? My emergency brake was on. And I'm too dumb to know any better, you know? I finally got to the church. It was about 12 to 15 miles away. My dad's standing in the parking lot, his three-piece suit, his briefcase. I pull in. I'm like, hey, Dad! His smile went to this because he saw smoke coming from the wheels. I, he said, what are you doing? I said, what? He said, do you smell that? Suddenly I did. <laughs> he said, what are you doing? I said, what do you mean? He said, the emergency brake is on. He said a lot of other things to me that morning. <laughs> I won't say them all today. <laughs> he calmed down. I calmed down. We went out a couple days later, and he, he said to me, he said, Josh, let me ask you a question. Like, you're so dumb. Um, <laughs> what? You don't know what you don't know till you know what you know. You don't know. I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know. <laughs> he said, as you pulled out of the driveway and as you changed into gear, he said, couldn't you sense that something was, like, holding you back? And I'm like, yeah, but I just thought that was normal. And he said, it's not, it's not normal, stupid. <laughs> He's a very mean man. <laughs> Look at me. Can't you sense that something's been holding you back? You're looking up here and you're like, Pastor, but I thought that was normal. It's not normal. Something is pulling you back as you move forward for God. And could it be this people-pleasing, addiction to approval mentality is pulling you back? Isn't it time to not start viewing them as enemies, but as possible converts, and stop caring what they think all the time? This, this is how Jesus dealt with his haters. Let's pray. Father in heaven, your grace is sufficient and your love powerful. And these words that we've studied, so true. God, my prayer is that every one of us in this room would take to heart the truths that you've taught us today and been demonstrated in the life of Jesus. I thank you for a Savior who is so willing to come and die for the sins of mankind, including ours. I pray for my friends that they would receive that truth even today. If God has used this message to impact your life, we would love to hear from you please send an email to connectdesk at southernhillslv.com. If you would like to support this ministry financially, you can do so at southernhillslv.com slash give. We are always encouraged to hear how God is using this church in Las Vegas to reach God's people around the world.